So, since I'm creatively bankrupt and need a break for a little bit, and my wish is to eventually shill as hard as Mother's Basement one day, I've decided to combine these two sins and rehash content I've already created in order to advertise a website that I happen to write on. That website is Dezu Daily, where I post a new article every Monday about what I think you should be watching this anime season. You can hear more about that at the end of the video if you're interested, but for now, I'll be talking about two anime I've really enjoyed so far this season. RE Creators and Grimoire of Zero. Recently, the isekai genre has grown to a sizable chunk of the anime market, thanks in large part to the highly successful Sword Art Online franchise, though the genre existed prior with popular titles like Dot Hack. In an effort to differentiate themselves from what's come before, anime have been attempting to turn the trope of being transported to another world on its head with a variety of successes and failures. But one of the currently airing anime gives its own unique twist on the genre by bringing the fantasy elements of other worlds to our world, and expanding on the ramifications of such beings existing in our plane. RE Creators offers a well-directed first episode, as we're introduced to the narrator Soda and lead character of the show Celestia, as they come together in a bizarre twist of fate that ends with Celestia being pulled into our world. What makes this series interesting right from the get-go is the isekai trope being flipped around, but the initial reactions and the way the characters act as they move through the plot of the narrative is what draws you in as you watch. Realistically, what would you do if you were suddenly transported from your fantasy land and ended up somewhere unfamiliar with a boy you've never met? If you answered holding your sword to the boy's throat and intimidating him to talk about what's going on, you'd probably have a lot in common with Celestia. On the other hand, if you decided to take a step back and really put some thought into what happened and why you're suddenly here and what amounts to the land of the gods, you might be Meteora, exposition machine and best girl all in one tiny hungry package. It turns out, all these different people being brought into the real world are popular characters from the various media in Japan, from video games to anime and even a mysterious origin for the main villain of the series, who we only know as Military Uniform Princess. So begins a story filled with intrigue as the characters realize their creators are somewhere in this new land, existing as the keys to the salvation of the creation's worlds, or just as assholes to confront for making the creation lives so shitty. This anime attempts to tackle a possible problem with creating entertainment in this anime's main world. And the meta-commentary that the world Soda inhabits may well be another layer of creation by the studio who actually make the anime in our world, offers a significant look into the way realities are linked, and the consequences of the actions we take when creating the world and characters in our stories. If you could meet the character you created, you might find yourself tied up and forced to fix their world. Or you might be left alone because you wrote your character to have fun and not care about anything like destiny or fixed fates. You might even work together with your creation to understand their place in the world and figure out why it happened and how you can help them get back to where they came from. All of these questions and stories are the backdrop to the main clash of the anime, between the creations that follow the military uniform princess's desperate crusade to crack the foundations of reality in the real world and the creations who align themselves with our narrator to limit the effect they have on the elasticity of the real world's ability to handle impossible concepts like unassisted flight, flying horses, mechs, and even a magical girl's traditionally harmless heart beams destroying buildings and slamming characters into the ground at speeds harmful enough even to their more hardened constitutions. In a way, this anime is a combination of Fate Stay Night and a reversed isekai story, but with anime characters instead of legends from the past, future, and present. The animation, while not nearly as incredible as the aforementioned Fate series, at least in UFO tables capable hands, is surprisingly crisp, and especially in the first episode, give an opportunity to shine from uncharacteristic viewpoints, such as the very smooth shot from behind Soda's glasses as he walks up the stairs. The battle sequences are impressive and flashy as different battle styles, weapons, and abilities are joined with the limitations of the real world placed upon them. Destruction caused by these characters fighting has actual consequences on the populace and world, so it's refreshing that RE Creators attempts to circumvent the Superman problem of thousands of lives being lost in incredible fights by actively showing the civilians being protected by the other characters as the battles wage, for instance the duel between Celestia and the magical girl Mamaka. While the music and battle sequence songs may grate on some, I found them to be acceptable to build the hype and follow through with the beats of the battle. The sound design in the show manages to crack and rumble in all the right spots, and the voices of the characters showcase a great range of seiyuu individually, as well as a group together. Unfortunately for some, this anime does have a lot of exposition early on, 
with episode 3 in particular being basically a monologue from Meteora about the effect these characters are having on the world. And while the anime makes attempts at keeping you interested through a PowerPoint of the characters doing cute things inside the house, I can perfectly understand why some people might find moments like these a little bit of a drag. However, this is a series with a half-and-half -half take on its division between combat and tactical or cerebral moments. And while there is a lot of exposition early on, this series is a two-core series, so it's nice to know that most of the explanations are coming at the beginning, so we can focus on what's going to happen in the plot as the anime continues on. On the other hand, I find the exposition quite interesting. Because I really enjoy the theoretical nature of the conversations Meteora brings up with Soda and the rest of the cast. Since I've also entertained thoughts about the ramifications the events in the anime would have in our actual real world several times throughout my life. Now, to switch gears toward a more traditional narrative that I also really enjoy, let's delve into why you should be watching Grimoire of Zero as well. A show with a realistic take on adventure in a world full of magic. To begin, adventure shows in anime that actually go out on an adventure and explore the world they're set in are unfortunately few and far between. Anime like Is It Okay to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon, Danmachi, or Konosuba that take place in a fantasy world rarely explore their worlds in any meaningful fashion, though Danmachi certainly gives it a good shot with the exploration of the titular dungeon. This sad fact about most adventure anime is why Grimoire of Zero is so remarkable in its ability to actually show what it'd be like to go on an adventure. A lot of the problem with making an adventure happen, I imagine, is down to the budget the show receives, as it's easier to create backgrounds and reuse assets if you stay in the same place and rarely venture out from there. But Grimoire of Zero manages to do exactly what I want, and then some. Each location the show has shown so far in the first three episodes has been pretty different from one to the other. From two large cities to a small village, and even two different heavily wooded forests. Each of these locations have had rather unique ecosystems, with the first town being extremely hostile to Beast Fallen, that is, Beastmen hybrids like the main character Mercenary, as well as witches like our co-star Zero. The second location, that of a forest with gigantic redwood-sized trees, was sparse of population aside from the witches that hide there to avoid the major cities. The third place, a small village of peasantry, showcased the fear-mongering that goes on among those with less education, as they first welcome Mercenary and the others, but immediately turn on them when the situation turns even the slightest bit sour. Accusations are thrown about, and the characters are forced to run and make it to the last location that the third episode takes place in, the big city that allows Beast Fall on within its walls. The atmosphere in the city is remarkable, in that you can actually feel the barely-held tolerance toward the Beast Fallen, though there is a big undercurrent of fear and threat as a result of the nature of these monstrous, cursed men. And in these locations is one of the best parts about the show. It's focus on the mundane problems and issues that come with actually having an adventure. Food, water, clothing, places to sleep, mistreatment by those who fear what they don't understand. Everything and everyone shown in this world that react to the main characters, and the way the main cast react to the world, are all impressive in their complexity. It actually feels like a real world. You can feel a sense of believability that permeates throughout the story, despite the huge beast-like shape of the main character and other fantasy elements like witches and sorcery. On the note of sorcery and magic, the magic system shown in the show was perfectly showcased to be less telling and more showing. The way Zero, the small companion of Mercenary, explains the difference between regular magic that most witches use and the sorcery that she created herself is expertly showcased as she talks about it while using it in battle. In a lot of ways, magic in the show is described similarly to the way Dungeons & Dragons magic differs between the spellcasting classes. In a similar vein, Dungeons & Dragons is definitely a huge influence in most adventure shows, and Grimoire of Zero is little different in that regard. A lot of anime that tend toward the adventurous prefer to stick the classes and mechanics of D&D and other role-playing games like it, but few work the story and lore into the shows like Grimoire of Zero does. In fact, the only other anime I can think of off the top of my head that comes close to the same feeling that Grimoire of Zero gives me is Hitsugi no Chaika, or Coffin Princess Chaika, which is also one of my favorite anime for its adventurous spirit and small party of compelling characters. Though these features do attract me to the show, and let me get through the burden of disbelief that shows like this have to hurdle over, I can certainly understand why it might not be the case for those of you who feel like these types of settings are too unbelievable. Especially with the main character being what amounts to a furry. As well, with such a small cast of characters, a lot of people might not feel like the anime is that strong, 
with its emphasis on a typical overarching story, which is to find the magical MacGuffin that has the ability to threaten the world and the fates and blah 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 if used by the wrong hands. Same story we've heard a million times. And it's easy to misunderstand or be confused about how the magic system works, even with the examples given and told through dialogue, if you don't have experience with Dungeons and Dragons or other types of RPGs prior to watching the show. Even with all these potential drawbacks though, I would definitely recommend Grimoire of Zero as an anime to anyone who even remotely enjoys adventure through a magical world. The characters, at least to me, feel realistic beyond their physical appearances, and you definitely shouldn't judge this book by its cover if you feel turned off by the furry appearance of its main character. It's rare that anime grab me from the get-go, but this anime is definitely one of those shows that does, thanks to its expressive main characters, realistic world circumstances of a religious faction intending to wipe out all magic and the witches who practice such devilry, racism against those considered cursed, and the general inclusion of mundane scenes like finding food, changing clothes, and all the things that people rarely think of when imagining those adventures they so wish for. Which is a point I made in my video about Konosuba. In the end, I hope I've clued you in onto why I find these two shows so fascinating, and I hope you also try to check them out based on my recommendations if you haven't already done so. There are quite a few good anime out each season that you might not pick up based on how it looks from the outside, and the goal of this video and the articles I write on Dezu Daily are to help you find shows you might otherwise write off. Like I said in the beginning, you can find these articles posted every Monday on Desu Daily, along with one of my previous videos for those who haven't already seen them. If you're interested in what I have to say in a less verbal format, please check them out. And if you're interested in making something of your own, Desu Daily is looking for content creators to share their works on the site, be they editorials and videos like me, or cosplay, fan fiction, fan art, and all the other kinds of art that our anime hobby inspires. You can apply for these positions by emailing DezuDaily at DezuDaily at gmail.com with the title of your email the position you want to try out. All of this is a grand experiment, so don't feel too bad if you mess up or don't get invited right away. Only together can we create something really awesome. And if you like being surrounded by other fans of anime, Desu Daily is a fun place to get started. The Discord can get a little rowdy sometimes though, so you might like that. And if you just want to interact with me directly, and why wouldn't you, you can always find me on Twitter, Tumblr, or my Reddit account. You can also go to my channel and subscribe if you haven't already, and click that notification button to know exactly when a new video goes up. But whatever your decisions, life choices, and anime preferences are, I hope you always remember to enjoy the way you watch anime. Because as long as you're having fun, that's all that really matters. I'll see you in the next one.